so uh, I'm going to do a presentation here. Um, I came up with a catchy title, Wi-Fi uh, 7 uh, Heaven or Wi-Fi 7 Deadly Sins. When you're in evangelism, you come up with goofy, catchy titles just to catch people's attention. Uh, Keith always likes us to have a lot of data for our presentations, but I'm going to be honest, this presentation is going to be a little bit more forward-looking and kind of talking about the potential of Wi-Fi 7 and what it, it could possibly mean for us or, or may not mean for us. Um, that being said, let's go ahead and get my clicker on. Sorry about that. Uh, if you don't know who I am, there's me. Uh, if you're not hooked up with me on LinkedIn, please do. Um, it's, uh, this is a great community. We should all uh, be linked with each other on LinkedIn as well as on Twitter. Um, so thank you for that. And if, I'm also the co-author of this big fat book about Wi-Fi. And uh, my co-author, as usual, is in Florida and not here. Now, um, if you haven't, unless you've been living under a rock for the last two years, a lot of us have been talking about um, six gigahertz or probably not talking about it correctly. We've been saying Wi-Fi 6E and really we should have the emphasis on six gigahertz because six gigahertz is the game changer. And now that came with the Wi-Fi 6E and I think we get too caught up sometimes in all these generations of Wi-Fi, but Wi-Fi 6E was the first generation that came, offered us this new six gigahertz superhighway, which is effectively uh, double of the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz band put together. And I've said this before, but I think this is probably the most pivotal moment and the biggest game changer since we went from SISO radios to MIMO radios, uh, what was that, 12, 14 years ago uh, with 802.11n. Now, um, so much so um, that I'm such a believer. I'm not the only one that is a big believer on this. Um, Dave Wright from uh, Aruba reached out to, uh, to me and all these other gentlemen up here on the screen and worked together with uh, Klaus Heading from Wi-Fi Now. We had like this uh, vendor uh, webinar where we all just kind of talked about uh, six gigahertz and how much we think it means for the Wi-Fi industry uh, moving forward. Um, and I think this, we were all kind of talking together, and I think this was the first time that um, the four biggest enterprise Wi-Fi companies kind of got together and talked together on the same subject. So uh, I had a lot of fun doing it. I also want to say, you know, we talk a lot about this being a community, and I thought um, uh, Jim was talking about heroes and, and peers and stuff like that. So these guys that I was able to be on a panel with, I mean, these guys were like my heroes. So it was uh, quite the honor and um, I also want to encourage everybody here you know Jim I think we uh, or somebody uh, Keith did uh, asked how many people were newbies here and I was like 40% of the room raised their hand so I want to encourage everybody um, you're already part of a community and I want to encourage everybody to do a presentation next year if you're new, you're a newbie, do a presentation. It shouldn't be just the same people doing it over and over. And every year, I, what's the percentage again that we get um, of people that actually present every year? Over 20%. So if you didn't present uh, this year, present next year and welcome to the community. It's, uh, if you get into other um, uh, IT communities, they're, they're not close knit like this. Um, they're actually <laughs> very competitive, but now, that being said, not only do the enterprise vendors, we, we, we don't just believe in six gigahertz for just to sell more APs. We really do believe it is the future of the Wi-Fi industry. And that being said, it has been a little bit of a slow burn, okay, and, but it is growing fast and it will continue to grow. And I don't know if you saw this, I think somebody else flashed this slide up yesterday, but um, this Intel has a tracker where they're tracking all the Wi-Fi 6C, or I should say uh, client devices and APs that have a six gigahertz radio in them. And the numbers are growing exponentially. Right now, we're sitting at, at almost a thousand laptops that have models that have a six gigahertz radio in them. And almost 100 smartphones. And now there's even about 50 televisions now that have six gigahertz radios in them. 
Even data collection devices like the handheld scanners that are used in warehousing, there's a couple of major vendors now that have six gigahertz radios in th that as well. Clients drive adoption quite a bit. As you can see, the adoption is uh, growing exponentially. And that will continue with the next generation, which is Wi-Fi 7. Now, there's the timeline, we've all seen it. I won't go over the historically, but Wi-Fi 6E and six, more specifically 6 gigahertz debuted in 2021, but what about Wi-Fi 7? Is it even a thing yet? Well, I'm not gonna speak for the Wi-Fi Alliance. I believe Kevin is uh, presenting uh, later um, this morning about the Wi-Fi Alliance, but it, back in May, they announced uh, that there will be a Wi-Fi 7 certification, but quite frankly, it doesn't exist yet. Work on the Wi-Fi 7 certification for interoperability is being done as we speak, but there's no interoperability testing yet at the moment. Now, that being said, you would think that Wi-Fi 7 is already a thing. You've probably first heard about it a year ago. And that's because all the chipset vendors like Broadcom and Qualcomm, they're very aggressively already marketing the technology. Okay, now I work for Extreme Networks. We partner with Broadcom, but I'm gonna tell you right now, um, there's not gonna be enterprise APs probably into uh, first quarter, second quarter of 2024. Okay, now we'll talk, why don't we talk a little bit more about that, okay? Um, the technology is coming. Um, as a matter of fact, you'll probably start seeing consumer grade stuff maybe as early as March, okay, of this year. Sometime in a March to a, a June timeframe, the consumer grade stuff always comes first. And it, usually it's for marketing, um, you, know, you know, bragging rights. Now that being said, how many feature sets do you think it's gonna have? Now, I haven't gotten into the features, we'll talk on them, there's about seven or eight uh, um, potential features, but um, multi-link operation, uh, 4K QAM, 320 megahertz channels, we'll, we'll talk about some of these, but how many do you think these are actually gonna support initially? My guess is maybe they might, these will be like Wi-Fi 7 Lite, maybe they'll support 4K QAM. Will they support the more advanced uh, features like multi-link operation? Probably not right away. Same thing with maybe the first smartphone. You'll probably see the first smartphone announced sometime in the same kind of time frame. okay? That being said, um, how many features they fully support in terms of what is eventually might be certified by the Wi-Fi Alliance and what we all will come to expect to operate um, remains to be seen, especially in the early days. Now, I do think you'll see more smartphones later in the year towards Q4, and they will probably have better feature capability as people start playing with the technology more and the, we can start getting the drivers and the kernels uh, co correctly. It takes time. What about enterprise? Well, you know what? Some vendors are already announcing APs, okay? But you know what? Nobody's gonna ship anything until the earliest enterprise AP. It's the earliest of Q4 of this year, probably going into 2024. There's one vendor um, that I'm not even really familiar with, but they, uh, they announced a Wi-Fi 7 AP in China. There's no six gigahertz in China, <laughs> you know? Uh, there's, and it doesn't look like there's gonna be six gigahertz in China anytime soon. Uh, the reason they did that is because the multi-link operation uh, feature, which you could potentially have a multiple, multiple links with two five gigahertz uh, links and uh, low, low five and upper five. And we'll talk more about that. Um, the enterprise space is not moving fast. Vendors like myself and our competitors, we're just now getting the reference boards in and, uh, and, and are just now starting to play with the technology and working with our chipset vendors. And it's got a long ways to go. But I, I would think though, you'll probably start seeing companies like uh, Extreme and others shipping maybe their first generation uh, high-end 4x4x4 um, Wi-Fi 7 APs, possibly Q1, Q, Q2 of 2024. Somebody might uh, be a little bit earlier. Now, all Wi-Fi 7 is based on an IEEE draft amendment. Um, in extremely high throughput. There's a lot of different things that are defined about it. We're gonna go over some of these. And the goal though, is to get um, theoretically 33 gigabits 
throughput, extremely high throughput, or data rates. Uh, how many think that you, of you out here think we're actually going to get that? Nobody? OK. All right. That's not surprising. We all know that medium contention uh, alone, that no way that's realistic. And we all know that these are marketing numbers, OK? It's kind of interesting. You know, we went from 8 or 2 11 AX, which was more about efficiency. And now we're back to speeds and feeds again, OK? Extremely high throughput. And that being said, um, uh, there's no way in the world we'll get anywhere to. Th that'll be on the, all the boxes in the marketing literature, 33 gig. But you know what? There was a demo um, last year between these guys, a co these co-vendors, Carlos and VJ. They did a demo between Broadcom and Intel with a client and an AP, and they demoed under controlled laboratory conditions, granted, uh, Wi-Fi uh, throughput, not data rates, but throughput of five gigabits per second. Okay? Now, will we see that in the real world? Probably doubtful. But um, under certain conditions, I think the throughput is definitely going to go up. And we'll talk more about that. Now, Wi-Fi 7, I think, will follow the trend of something that I've blogged about and written about. It's always fascinated me. It's called the consumerization of IT. And the whole point of the consumerization of IT is people adopt a technology at home. They like it. And they like it so much that they decide to bring it to work, and they force their the businesses and, and government to adopt it as well, OK? Wi-Fi is a perfect example of that technology. If you look at it historically, uh, Wi-Fi, everybody started buying uh, stuff at around 8 or 2, 11 B days. Uh, they loved the technology. There was no security in there, but they wanted it at work. Their IT administrator said, no, you can't have it. It's not secure. But what did they do? They brought it in anyway, right? So they forced the enterprise to deal with it, okay? Which also forced it to, to get more secure, which is how we eventually ended up with WPA2. Um, I think it'll be the same thing with Wi-Fi 7 um, and, and 6 gigahertz as well. Um, it, it, there, you will see people at more and more and more, they'll start adopting it at home, and then they will want to bring it in to work. Now, another thing about this to think about is, why do I think that, is um, there's all these broadband initiatives. Uh, Comcast, for example, announced about uh, last year that they have an initiative to get in like 50 million homes 10 gigabit uh, uh, through, uh, uh, pipes to the homes, at 50 million homes, okay? And other ISPs are having those initiatives as well. So you're going to have bigger pipes at the homes, so we're going to need bigger uh, uh, pipes at the access layer as well, and Wi-Fi is an access layer technology. Additionally, why do you think we need um, more uh, throughput in, uh, as well? So that's one thing that's driving <clears throat> the road to a need for more throughput and more bandwidth. Another thing is uh, m more and more and more applications are moving to the edge. Now, it started a lot with a lot of these cloud gaming applications where the processing is split between something, a device uh, at the, you know, that the user is using, as well as some of the processing being done in the cloud. There's a trend in networking that is moving that way as well, where we're taking a lot of the processing and calculations and putting the applications in containers and putting them back to the edge of the network. And, um, and if that's the case, that it will also increase our bandwidth and our throughput needs. Now, the other big one that you hear a lot about is VR and AR. Now, I know a lot of people think of virtual reality in the enterprise as marketing hype. But you know, I've, I've come to become a big believer that we're really going to start seeing a renaissance of these technologies over the next 10 years in the enterprise, not just for gaming. I, I've come to befriend a guy that is an analyst named Thomas Brannon uh, that specializes in VR and AR. And he helped us develop at Extreme these infographics. And um, there is going to be uh, not only high bandwidth needs for virtual reality, but also high processing that's being pushed back to the edge. And another important thing is latency, which is another big goal of Wi-Fi 7. 
Um, another, uh, I'm actually a bigger believer where I think we're going to go is augmented reality. I think this will find us this way into the enterprise over the coming 10 to 15 years. There's a lot of people like my friend Thomas that believe that Apple and Google are going to be coming out with augmented reality headsets in the next few years that will be... Um, uh, also leverage some of the processing power in your phones, and maybe eventually, by sometime in the mid-2030s, could maybe even replace smartphones, okay? Um, and with these technologies, guess what medium that it's going to, they're going to depend on? It's not going to be a wire, okay? Not at the access layer. It's going to be wireless, and it could use multiple wireless technologies. You hear 5G bragging about it, uh, solving a, uh, AR and VR being the miracle app on 5G. Quite frankly, it's going to be Wi-Fi. Okay? Now, let's start talking about some of the features that are going to come with Wi-Fi 7. Now, here's the one, and I'm going to talk about the ones that are going to get the most hype to begin with, First, especially on the consumer grade side. This one first, 320 megahertz channels. So is this Wi-Fi 7 heaven or is this a deadly sin? Well, you know what? I promise you every single consumer grade uh, router that comes out starting this year will have this on as the default setting. It will be the default setting. Now, by the way, where those 320 megahertz channels sit depend on the region um, that that you're at, but it's basically three channels, and that's assuming you have all the six gigahertz space. We all know this isn't going to scale in a channel reuse pattern in the enterprise. Um, to me, this is a deadly sin, and, there, and uh, not because we can't use it on the enterprise, but I did a presentation last year with the help, uh, help uh, data that I got from my good friend Carl Benedict, who's here in the room, where we basically proved that um, OBSS interference is a problem um, with um, in, in six gigahertz still. And in this example, you can see if you don't have your primary uh, and secondary primary channels lined up, in this example of 40 megahertz and 80 megahertz, you're guaranteed to get OBS interference, which causes your throughput to drop. So the same thing's gonna happen if you have a neighboring uh, home router or device that somebody spins up on a 320 megahertz channel, the same thing's gonna happen. You're gonna have OBSS interference as a result. So that's a sin. So I'm not a big fan of the 320 megahertz channels, but by the way, all the enterprise vendors are gonna support it too, and you know why we're gonna have to support it? It's called an RFP checkbox, okay? Because if we don't support it, our competitors will. Will you ever use it in the enterprise? Probably never, unless you're in, in a, a Faraday cage. Now, that being said, um, we, uh, hopefully everybody here in the room uh, understands, uh, has a ba basic understanding of QAM modulation. Um, the new thing that's coming, another thing that's coming that's going to get a boatload of hype is the 4K QAM. Um, it's supposed to give us like a 20% uh, increase in throughput and performance. Uh, the problem is, uh, is this Wi-Fi 7 heaven or is it a deadly sin? The problem is uh, you're going to need an SNR that's basically ridiculous. I think for 256 QAM, when that was in introduced, to use that, you need a, a SNR of 25 dB. With 1024 QAM that was introduced with Wi-Fi 6, you need like, uh, what is it, 30, 32 dB. And with uh, 4096 QAM, it's going to be like 41 dB. No way you're ever going to get that in 2.4, probably not in 5, maybe in 6, because it is a pristine RF environment, but you're going to have to be very close to the AP. This is a consumer-grade feature. Will it work? Probably, but you know, the conditions are going to have to be right. Now, the one that gets all the hype is the multi-link, uh, another one that gets a lot of the hype, and this is the one that also I think holds a lot of promise, is the multi-link opera uh, operation. Think multiple bands and multiple channels, okay? Now, there's different kinds of multi-link operation, and we're going to cover that, but let's get into some of the terminology here first. So, uh, Wi-Fi devices that use multi-link operation are referred to a multi-link device, and there's a framework, and the framework includes single radio operations and multi-radio operations. There's also a whole new MAC layer that's been built, and I'll talk about that. The goal, there's basically three goals with a multi-link operation, higher throughput, lower latency, and increased reliability. And there's different methods. You can aggregate a link, you can steer a link, uh, which I think is going to be the one that will probably be the mo most prevalent, or there can also be what is known as redundant links. Now, 
And, and this, these next three slides are just doing a different visualization of what I just showed you on the previous slide. So bottom line is, with multi-link aggregation um, operation, one method is you could have a data aggregation method. So a five gigahertz and a six gigahertz, two channels, radios communicating at the same time, but what effectively is that gonna do to your throughput? Your throughput's gonna double, okay? You could do this with three radios. Um, the, um, so now, um, and you hear a lot about that. This is the one that's gonna get hyped the most because that's gonna give us the speed, uh, one of the things that's gonna give us the speeds and feeds. But I'm not very confident this is the one that's gonna work so well, and I will talk a little bit more about it. Um, I am confident that this will work pretty well, um, and I don't, list, evidently, I don't have the slide, but it, that'll work pretty well for mesh, and I'll talk more about that as well. The, uh, there's also the potential for having duplicate data for data redundancy. So if some of your data gets uh, corrupted on one link, you'll have redundant data on the other. And so um, that will also enhance you know, performance as well and reliability. Now, that being said, um, this is the one that I think will um, absolutely, at least on the client side, um, will see the, the most benefit from initially, and it will be the one that will potentially work initially. And that's the link steering. So think of, um, and this could be in both directions, think of the radios um, listening on two bands, on two channels at the same time, and then based on that listening, uh, wh whichever one comes available first or is the cleanest, transmit on that band back and forth, back and forth. Now, that'll ha absolutely... Uh, lower latency, and you can also make an argument that will also enhance throughput and perform uh, and better performance and better throughput because you're accessing a, a particular band with medium access faster than you would be if you were waiting just on one. But it's the latency that um, that is really important here, especially for some of those time-sensitive applications like VR and AR. Now there is. It gets, uh, let's get a little bit more technical here. There's going to be two MAC layers, okay? Uh, there's gonna be an upper MAC and there's going to be a lower MAC. The upper MAC, its job is to communicate with the LLC. The lower MAC is just like you guys are uh, used to. That's where the radios exist. That's where their, their MAC addresses are. That's where association will, will occur, uh, standard association. But, Actually, it's not completely true. I'll explain it in a little bit more detail in a minute. But up most all, that's where all the management frames are. Um, it's all, where all this, uh, a lot of the security mechanisms operate as well. Uh, the upper MAC is kind of just a bridge between what we already have uh, with Wi-Fi and the lower MAC and the LLC. Now, the upper MAC is important because it's, there's actually going to be a MAC address there um, to communicate to the LLC. And, and you'll see that in just a minute. Um, there is going to be a new element, another information element, so that your, bigger, your beacons are going to get bigger, okay? And it's going to have um, all the parameters of the multi-link operation, like what radios are being used and what type of multi-link operation you're using. Additionally, there's going to be a discovery and setup mechanism that is used in multi-link operations. So, Think about it uh, this, there's going to be an association request from a client that, let's say a Wi-Fi 7 client, and it'll have that MLE element in it that has all the information about uh, you know, what channels it wants to use across the various frequencies, but it'll also have an MLD uh, common information, which includes a MAC address that is in that upper MAC. And you'll see what the, one of the reasons that's used for here in a minute. It's, it's basically used for layer two communication to the LLC, but it's also used in a security process. You'll see that in just a second. Um, so, um, and then there'll be in a response where the AP will um, exchange likewise information, and then they'll move on to your four-way handshake. Now, this is actually kind of cool, and th that for Wi-Fi geeks like me, I just get geeked out about things like this, and um, like we have a whole room of uh, Wi-Fi geeks, but you have, um, most of you have probably become familiar with the four-way four handshake in your career. Um, it's one of the first things you learn about security, and you know that there's um, a, a seed and that there's MAC addresses used to establish dynamically generated unicast encryption keys, okay, with the four-way handshake. 
um, there's MAC addresses that are used in a, in a formula um, to generate those keys. We're not gonna get into the whole process. You learned that in CWSP or in Jennifer's class. Now, that being said, um, it's different. That MAC address, that the MAC addresses that are used is that upper layer MAC, okay? And that is used to finally create that dynamically generated unicast key. You know why that's cool? Think about the steering, okay? So just think about, let's go back to old band steering. So uh, band steering is proprietary, but think about it right now. If you band steer between a, a five gigahertz and a 2.4 gigahertz, you're effectively, every time you go, a client moves between a band, what does it have to do when it moves from a, to a different radio? It has to do a new four-way handshake. Well, you don't need to do this anymore because this is a multi-link uh, uh, association and that multi-link association uses a MAC address. There's that upper MAC. That is used as a seed for the four-way handshake. So you could keep that same finely generated, dynamically generated unicast key as you jump between the bands, whether you're doing aggregation or it's steering. Okay? And you don't have to do that extra establishment of a four-way handshake each and every time. Um, so that's actually pretty cool. Now, there are different types of multi-link operations. So let's start talking about it from a, a client perspective. Um, I mentioned there's going to be uh, multi-link single radios, and there's also going to be uh, uh, multi-link operation methods that use multiple radios. And I'm, I'm talking mostly here from a client perspective right now. Um, now, there'll be different access methods as well. And this is the one that will, I think, be um, the one that works, okay, at least initially, okay, and that is enhance multi-link single radio channel access. Now, think of a two-by-two two client, because most clients are two-by-two, two, okay, they can use one radio chain and one antenna to listen to like five gigahertz or 2.4 gigahertz, and another to listen to the other one, okay. Um, now, whichever medium becomes clear, first and it is available, they can switch to that channel and transmit with a two by two in that channel. And theoretically, this can be done on a packet per pack, packet per passes basis. Now talking to um, uh, our engineers, talking to the chipset vendors, and just my general impression is I feel that this is the one that'll probably be the one that works to begin with, okay? Uh, it's not the one that's gonna get the most hype but it's definitely the one that I think holds the most promise initially. Now, there will be, another, there's a couple other methods, and I'm not gonna go into a heavy deep dive on them, but this is the other one that will probably see absolutely supported uh, uh, with a goal of aggregation. Um, and it's called simultaneous transmit and receive multi-link multiple radio, an another big acronym for you guys to learn. Now, that being said, it's all about aggregation. Um, uh, the problem is um, I don't see this personally as being something, at least from the client side, that's going to be used a lot. So, uh, and I think Mecca Drago spoke about this last year a little bit. There's been some research done that shows, here's the problem. Let's say you, you're, you're aggregating on a five gigahertz and a six gigahertz link, okay? And say you're doing that, and um, what if, for this to work, there has to be, for a certain amount of synchronization, okay? And if the five gigahertz network is busy and the six gigahertz network is not, before you can start transmitting on the six and aggregate it with the five, what do you have to do? You gotta wait. So that medium contention, that wait time will actually cause your throughput potentially to go lower. So if you start getting into busy mediums, I just don't see um, how this is gonna work out that well. Now, I'm still hopeful, okay, but I'm well, like a lot of people in this room, you know, I'm an evangelist for the technology and I'm very hopeful for Wi-Fi 7, but I don't believe anything until not only is it proven in a lab, but more importantly, until it's field tested, okay? So a lot of times we see things work in labs and in Faraday cages, but when they get out in the real world, um, 
They just don't pan out that much. And the medium contention aspect of this alone doesn't give me a lot of hope for this, but you know, I could be wrong. Um, now, that being said, I do view this as a great technology for mesh, okay? Uh, because um, you're not necessarily dealing with medium contention, especially if you isolate a channel and you dedicate it just for that mesh link. Um, I view this as a great opportunity to getting greater throughput on links on six, on not just six gigahertz, but on a multi-link group mesh. Okay, I've heard so other people say, oh yeah, we'll use the 320 megahertz channels for mesh. No, um, I think the better thing will be able to have a multi-link group where you maybe have a mesh established on maybe two six gigahertz channels, or maybe two five gigahertz channels, or maybe a five and a six. So I think you'll see vendors um, like Extreme and others do creative stuff with the aggregation components with mesh. There's another mesh techno uh, aggregation technology as well um, called non-standard um, access, channel access. I'm um, not going to get into it because I don't think it's going to be widely supported. Now, there will be new power save mechanisms too. So um, if you have a, a multi-link association where you're on different frequencies and different channels, um, the TIM and the DTIM, they're going to have to be link aware, okay? Additionally, um, the target wake time will have to be uh, link aware. There's going to be some enhancements to dynamic spatial multiplex power save where you're turning off radio chains on the APs and also on clients. Um, that's also going to have to be multi-link layer. And you will see some enhancements with every generation of Wi-Fi. There's new power saving mechanisms uh, and enhancements to, so we can save battery life. Now, let's go back and circle back um, to Wi-Fi 6, um, where, it, where we debuted OFDM. And with OFDM, uh, everybody knows um, you subdivided a channel, and you did it with resource units. And uh, typically, in a 20 megahertz channel, we can, in most cases, we can divide it up as much as into four uh, little uh, resource units or baby channels, or more commonly two. Um, now, that being said, there's a new feature that I do kind of think will work and is going to be interesting, and it's called multi-RU. And there's two different types. There's one called multi-RU with um, small and one large. With small, it's all about, in some cases, when you're doing OFDM, OFDM A, there's certain portions of the spectrum of that channel that aren't being used. And so this is to make it more efficient. So what you can actually do is you can kind of squish together a couple of resource units for the same client that are of different sizes. So in this example here, uh, within 120 megahertz boundary in an 80 megahertz channel, and these, by the way, also have to be contiguous, you see a 26 and a 52 um, um, uh, resource units kind of combined together. The, um, and you can see that throughout this, and they have to um, be contiguous, and they have to stay within that 20 megahertz boundary. The goal of this is better use of the available spectrum and make it, uh, the resource units more efficient. Now, there's another one that also has potential, and that's the large, where um, in this case, you're using um, kind of using uh, multiple resource units together for one particular client in, in a channel, but they're uh, for larger channels like 80 megahertz and even the 160 and 150. In, in this example, you can see a 242 together with a 484. What is the purpose of this? The purpose of this, this is also related to a feature that I do think holds promise, and that is the puncturing. So if you remember with Wi-Fi 6, it introduced something called preamble puncturing where you could puncture a portion of a channel if there was RF particular interference or even OBSS interference. And by puncturing that, you, didn't just, you, just, you don't use all the channel, you just kind of avoid that interference by not transmitting on that small punctured channel. The original goal for this was to help uh, deal with OBS-S interference, but you know where this is gonna have a nice play? This is gonna have a play with AFC, okay? So with AFC, um, you know, we all know, and I think uh, Stuart's doing a presentation on it tomorrow, um, the, um, uh, it's all about using standard power, but you have to check in with an, uh, an AFC provider, and it's all about avoiding, uh, you know, being proactively avoiding interference with the existing incumbents. Well, this using the puncturing might also be a way 
to do that. Okay, you'll still have to check in with the AFC provider, but if um, you might be able to use you know, that big 80 megahertz channel, but just not transmit in that little punctured area because that's where the incumbent is. Okay, so that holds promise with the AFC. By the way, um, uh, others will be talking about AFC. The biggest problem with AFC right now still is regulatory. We're still waiting on it, okay? Um, I'm not gonna give you a date, but um, it's, we're still waiting on it and hopefully um, we'll have it in the United States later this year. Um, now, there are some other features as well um, that have been mentioned that are not gonna make it in Wi-Fi 7. So 802.11be has defined something called multi-AP operation. With multi-AP operation, it's coordinating APs, to multiple APs to communicate down to one client, or one client to communicate with multiple APs at the same time. And it defines three MAC methods and two physical methods. This sounds awesome and amazing, and I was particularly interested in it because uh, I start, uh, the first vendor I worked for was Arrowhive Networks, which innovated a distributed architecture. So I, naturally, I was uh, interested in this. It's not happening. Wi-Fi 8, maybe, okay? now. That being said, I will say this, Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 7 features will thrive in, in 6 gigahertz. We all know that um, the, the older generations of Wi-Fi were only single user but with OFDM, but then we introduced OFDMA with Wi-Fi 6 and, and extended it with Wi-Fi 6E. Does it work? A little bit, okay? Uh, doesn't work that great in the legacy bands, um, with, uh, but we're already seeing some data that it works very well in the six gigahertz bands. And that's one of the reasons with the six gigahertz band, you don't have the backward compatibility. Some of these features are gonna flourish better in six gigahertz than they are in the other bands. Um, there are also going to be some tweaking to the uh, buffer status reports to make them more efficient for uplink uh, uh, OFDMA for Wi-Fi 7. Multi-user MIMO. How many of the people in this room have gotten multi turn, turn on multi-user MIMO? Really? One, two, we got two people. Okay, so the only use case that I've ever seen where multi, it's been proven to me that multi-user MIMO works with Wi-Fi is in a point to multi-point bridge link. Okay, um, and uh, where they're stationary and uh, there's distance between, between them uh, and they're not mobile, it works. Uh, in uh, an indoor environment with lots of users, the technology doesn't work unless you're, in most cases, unless you're in a Faraday cage. That being said, you'll, um, you know, you can always hold that hope, but there is talk of 16 by 16 by 16, and somebody else was on stage, I, uh, we had a, uh, talking about this, um, which uh, brings me to the form factors. Okay, most AP, you know, in the early days, APs had two antennas. Then we had four. <laughs> then we saw eight by eight by eight. Do you really want a donkey with 16 ears? <laughs> okay. Um, you know, aesthetics are very big in this industry. I don't know. Somebody will probably build one, but like, I'll argue all day long how ridiculous eight by eight by eight is. Okay, it's the only thing 8x8 ever did for anybody is it made a couple of vendors a lot of money. Okay, <laughs> so, um, so <laughs> now that being said, uh, I do think there will be a resurgence in dual 5 gigahertz and SDR modes. Okay, because um, not just because of the multi link operation, but um, in some cases, in prepping uh, as the client, as we're waiting for the client populations of Wi-Fi 7 to come along, there's still, how many billion clients are there that don't even operate on six gigahertz? There's like 18 billion. So already vendors are offering all kinds of different uh, uh, SDR capabilities and we will see a resurgence in dual five. Dual five, five gigahertz is still um, the biggest band and will be, but six gigahertz is, is the future. Now, that being said, uh, there's other things you need to think about with multi-link operations. So with multi-link operations, you have to worry about what's called a critical update procedure, okay? So let me ask you this. What if, what if you have a multi-link between a five gigahertz and a six gigahertz, and one of the five gigahertz was a DFS channel, and there was a channel switch announcement? Where does that five gigahertz radio go? It goes somewhere else, right? So there has to be parameters for the AP to communicate 
to the Wi-Fi 7 clients, yeah, we're changing one of our multi-link channels. And it has to be done in a way so that there's not a, re uh, a forced reassociation. Okay, so that, you'll, you'll see that, okay? And not just DFS, RRM, okay? A any vendor's RRM protocol, all of a sudden they change channels. If that channel was part of the multi-link group, um, there's going to have to be a, a method where the AP can communicate the changing of the parameters without forcing a reassociation, okay? How about this? How about multi-link reconfiguration? It's called AP removal. Think about this. Let's say we have a multi-link uh, group with a five gigahertz and a six gigahertz radio, and uh, one of the APs goes into a client mode where it associates with a nearby AP. What just happened to your multi-link? Well, it went down, so you just lost five gigahertz in that example, but you don't want to disrupt the communications. So effectively what you'll do is you'll, you'll still keep it up and running, but you're keeping it up and running on just the one link, okay, without forcing a reassociation. Another thing is this. What if you had the six gigahertz AP radio go into doing a little packet sniffing, okay? What just happened to that multi-link operation? Well, uh, effectively, you're removing that radio from the multi-link uh, user uh, group, okay? But you want to keep the, maybe there could be two more radios involved. You want to keep that operational without for forcing a complete reassociation. Design considerations. You know, I got up on stage here and I challenged everybody to think out of the box with six gigahertz, and I've already seen some of that. I want to continue that challenge. Um, and, you know, I had a long conversation with Jim Palmer. And it's like, the more and more I'm thinking about this, it's like we need to start, let's not make the same mistakes that we've made in the past in six gigahertz. And I'm starting to think more and more and more it's going to be application driven and we're going to do a lot of segmentation on six gigahertz with um, uh, high profile applications that we segment specifically on six gigahertz. Um, but, uh, and, and I do want to continue that challenge also with Wi-Fi 7, and please bring it to this conference and show us what design uh, things that you've come up with. Let's talk about some of the other needs too. So guys, I know everybody's tired of this, but are we going to need uh, 10 gig, multi gig? Uh, yeah, that's nonsense. As a matter of fact, I've had people, I've had people start asking this. Okay, and yes, there's some APs with fiber uplinks for like outdoor deployments, but no, just because, you know, even if you had five gigahertz throughput, like in the Intel and Broadcom demo, you're not going to need a 10 gig multi gig uplink, and you're not going to need fiber. Now, you're probably going to throw eggs at me for saying this, okay? Because historically, for 10 years, people have been saying we need multi gig and we need to upgrade our switches. But based on some of the demos I've seen, I think there's no harm, no foul for maybe thinking now it's time to start upgrading your switches at least to uh, 2.5 or 5 multi-gig. Uh, um, there's no harm, no foul. The prices have come down. Um, all the high-end APs will have 10 gig multi-gig ports on them, and the lower 2 by 2s will have 5 on them. Will you need that on the switching side? No. Okay, but I'm, I'm, I'm confident, I think, that as we move forward, one gig is going to uh, go beyond just exceeding one gig is going to go beyond corner cases. Now, uh, historically, I'll probably be proven wrong, but I'm just, I, I think now uh, is probably the time and the pricing is cheap, so just do it. The, the bigger concern remains PoE. Um, you know, with the four by four by fours, you're, to have full chains and all the chains now, you're going to need BT power, okay? Um, there will be downgrade capabilities where you'll be able to downgrade to three by three by three uh, with AT, um, and you will probably still be able to run two by two by twos on AT, okay? But uh, uh, Wi-Fi 7 is going to be even more intensive, and you know, you know, you need to think about that. You know, you need to be thinking about your power budgets. That's what I'm most worried about. Somebody else said that yesterday as well. Be thinking about your power budgets. Um, and, uh, and that gets tricky too, especially when you get into co uh, countries like in Europe where there's all these green initiatives as well. So I think you're, you're going to see more and more innovations from the vendor on what, our, how can we do to conserve power on our network when, during off hours where we're powering down radio chains or powering down APs. Just know that these devices are going to be power pigs. They're going to need a lot of power to have full functionality. 
okay, moving forward. And, and, and you know, we all know what happens to an AP if it's not getting full power, the power that it needs, what do they start doing most of the time? They start randomly rebooting. That's like troubleshooting 101 where your APs are randomly rebooting. They're probably not getting enough power. Now, there, to my surprise, there's been a lot of talk about security. You know, when Jennifer got up here, you know, I knew she was going to talk about security, but about like seven people talked about WPA3 um, yesterday. And as you know, WPA3 is what you need in six gigahertz. You're required to use it in six gigahertz. It's been around for like three years. But um, I can tell you right now, in the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz span, there's less than 5% of people using WPA3 in the enterprise. And the, um, the reason is um, the transition modes, they don't work. I mean, they work, but here's the problem. I mean, you had several people say, don't use transition modes. I'll take it a step further. Transmission modes are evil, okay? The, um, the problem with transition modes is if it's drivers, quite frankly. You turn them on and uh, the legacy drivers see a weird information element and you start having connectivity uh, issues. So I can promise you, most people have not turned it on. Now that being said, I would love to see a day where we're using WPA3 in the legacy bands, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. If you control, if you can control the client population, go for it. But in most cases, you can't control the client population. But we have that opportunity with six gigahertz. By the way, with Wi-Fi 7, the uh, higher um, uh, security protocols of 256 bit with GCMP are, no, are probably no longer going to be optional. Um, support will probably be mandatory. Doesn't mean you have to turn it on. But um, right now, this is just optional. Uh, that being said, I've mentioned this before, with six gigahertz in the legacy bands, you're probably gonna do a, a different SSID strategy because of the different security. So you're probably gonna be using WPA3 or OWE on six gigahertz, and you're gonna be using WPA2 or open on five gigahertz. And that being said, and by the way, that research from Wes was really cool about, uh, and we've seen similar stuff about the inner band roaming um, which band it'll prefer, and usually it'll prefer six gigahertz if you have the bigger channels, and that's a good thing. But here's the thing. Are you going to be using the same security between bands? In most cases, no, okay? Uh, I'm not going to say always. Um, there's ways and workarounds for uh, edge roam, but bottom line, in most cases, no. So I don't really see a need for inner band roaming between five and six, at least at the moment, okay? Now it's going to get more complex with Wi-Fi 7. Now you're going to have most Wi-Fi 7, if you're using multi-link operation, you're going to be taking an advantage of one of the radios is going to be on 6 gigahertz, which means what version of security do you have to use for the multi-link operation? You're going to have to use WPA3. So now your strategy isn't just so much, it's still based on 6 gigahertz, but any MLO SSIDs that you have are going to have to use WPA3, and they're probably going to be separate from the ones that you're going to use for the legacy clients. So you're actually going to effectively, if you're going to use multi-link operation, you're effectively going to have to have a separate security because I promise you the, multi, the legacy clients are going to have a problem with it. So think about this. This, is, I think, is pretty important. Um, I, same thing with WIPs. You know, there'll be new attacks that are based on Wi-Fi 7. You know, uh, rogue detection is best if you can actually detect it in the 6 gigahertz band. Um, we're starting to do, us and other vendors are starting to do things with their WIPs where you can uh, look at the R&R &R information element in the other bands to detect a rogue. But that's assuming the rogue is transmitting in the other bands. So nothing beats having something scanning on six gigahertz for WIPs. Um, and I, I promise you the bad guys will think of creative attacks in Wi-Fi 7. Hands off to Adrian again and the other vendors in this room. I wrote a blog about all the troubleshooting tools that are already available for six gigahertz in Wi-Fi 6E. Um, that being said, um, we're going to have to start thinking about it with Wi-Fi 7. All right. So how, all right, Peter McKenzie, where are you? Are you still in the room? Ah, he bailed. All right. Um, thanks, Peter. I'll remember that when you're presenting tomorrow. No. Um, the uh, <laughs> the uh, 
nothing but love in this room. Um, that being said, uh, I was having a discussion with Peter. It's like, all right, how are we going to, you know, we, we're already still trying to figure out how we're going to do packet captures and put them together for OFDMA. What are we going to do with multi-link operation? Um, it may not be as hard as we think, but, you know, especially with the, steer, the steering, but how are you going to put it back together and how are you going to visualize that? And same thing with the aggregation. How are you going to put it back together and visualize that? How are you going to troubleshoot that? And not just, I'm not just talking about Wireshark. I'm talking about all the tools. By the way, the cloud vendor tools as well. How are we going to visualize this stuff? How are we going to troubleshoot it? It's a lot to think about in the coming years. This is not, I'm not saying this is a bad thing, you know, but it doesn't mean that we're going to solve these problems overnight. Okay. Now, once again, I am cognizant to the update fatigue. Every year, we as vendors come and say, it's time to upgrade new technology, and the customers are like, ah, again? You know, typically uh, enterprise Wi-Fi cycles, depending on the uh, vertical, five years, some longer, okay, um, some shorter. Um, that being said, um, there's, um, you know, there's been some talk uh, by some analysts out there, I'm not going to name that, uh, over the last couple of years, that are, they're still recommending, believe it or not, Wi-Fi 5. And now, there's nothing wrong with Wi-Fi 5. It works. Here's the problem, or, or they're recommending, uh, um, not, I shouldn't say Wi-Fi 5. Wi-Fi 5, in some cases, they're recommending Wi-Fi 6. Okay, if you're going to do an upgrade, they're saying Wi-Fi 6. What's the problem if you, as a consultant, make the recommendation for a customer that was updating now for something they're going to use for at least five years, maybe longer, if you recommend Wi-Fi 6. What's the problem with that? No 6 gigahertz for five years. No 6 gigahertz. So, uh, respectively, I disagree with those analysts. If somebody's due for a refresh now, and they want to refresh now, give them Wi-Fi 6E. Okay? And Wi-Fi 7's coming. So there was another gentleman who spoke about, you know, I'll just wait for Wi-Fi 7. So I've used this analogy before. Um, you know, whenever you buy a car or a truck, there's always a newer model um, that comes out next year. So last year, I bought a Dodge Ram pickup truck, 2021. I love the thing to drive in my mountain homes and driving around the mountain four-wheel drive is awesome. Okay, the 2022s came out the next year. I didn't care. So the analogy with Wi-Fi 6E, or I should say 6 gigahertz, is my truck came with a brand new superhighway. It came with a 6 gigahertz superhighway that was an exclusive superhighway that only I got to drive my truck on because there wasn't a lot of other trucks that had access to that 6 gigahertz superhighway. So some people are saying, I'll just wait for Wi-Fi 7. Well, you know, it just depends where you are in your refresh cycle. You're going to make that decision, but just make the decision uh, to get 6 gigahertz, whether it's Wi-Fi 6E or next year with Wi-Fi 7. There's always going to be something around the corner. Now, I will say this. My wife for Christmas did some enhancements to my truck. That's Wi-Fi 7. I, I got it lifted 6 inches. I got 35-inch wheels, and I got the fender flares. And that's what Wi-Fi 7 is. It's going to have a... Uh, you'll still have access to that 6 gigahertz highway, but you're going to have some new bells and whistles and some new features. But the key, the critical key is that my pickup, my Dodge Ram pickup truck, is all jacked up right now. I've gone full redneck, okay? Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's going to be able to drive on the 6 gigahertz superhighway, which is the future of Wi-Fi. And I got like two slides left in my last minute here. And I'll say this, I stole this slide. This comes from a convention, from a competing uh, vendor that's having a convention in Amsterdam right now. I don't care, I'm stealing it. Um, and, uh, and it just shows uh, spectrum analysis, what's going on here. You can see 2.4 is a clown show, five gigahertz is a party, and look at six gigahertz, the pristine RF environment. The potential for there is wonderful. So I, once again, I challenge everybody to be learning more about Wi-Fi 7. Uh, we have some time. We're not going to see it in the enterprise until next year. Um, but Wi-Fi 7 is great. But you know what? After Wi-Fi 7, it's going to be Wi-Fi 8. And after Wi-Fi 8, it's going to be Wi-Fi 9. 
the key component that's going to be behind it, the one consistent component, is that 6 gigahertz spectrum. So I'll, I'll say and end it, it's not always just about the features, it's about the spectrum. And thank you very much.